Good evening, everyone. Special thanks for coming out tonight on another beautiful evening here in paradise. We actually are in paradise, right? Uh, the township. Uh, I'm Bill Brown of Brookings Mountain West. Welcome on behalf of my colleagues. Uh, we're going to have a very interesting topic tonight on, as you can see, the causes and consequences of student discipline disparities uh, in K-12 education. We're thrilled to have our colleague John Vallant out from the Brookings Institution, and in particular, the Brown Center on Education Policy, where he and his colleagues focus on these kinds of issues. And I think I can speak for all of us when I can say we can never have too many graduates of the University of Michigan here to speak. <laughs> right. uh, let me thank our colleagues in Greenspun Hall uh, who are recording the lecture tonight. So if you want to refer back uh, to anything you see or hear tonight, it'll be up on our website in a few days. Uh, the PowerPoint that John will be going through tonight will also be up on our website. So uh, do not hurt yourself recording any data points or things like that. You'll be able to refer back to it. And let me tell you a little bit about John. He's a fellow at the Brookings Institution where he studies K-12 education policy and politics with a focus on urban schools and educational equity. And he holds a PhD in education and an MA in political science from Stanford and an MPP from the Harvard Kennedy School and a BA from the University of Michigan. Like all our visiting Brookings scholars, John's been in UNLV classes throughout the week, both undergraduate and graduate, meeting with faculty and students, collaborating on some research projects. He's going to present data and information on this topic tonight on the national level, but also give us a look at Las Vegas and, and Nevada. So let me step aside and invite John to come up. Thanks so much, Bill. And how is everybody? Uh, so that was a, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> um, that was a very nice introduction. As Bill said, I'm an education policy researcher. And uh, most of the work I do is quantitative education policy analysis. And virtually all of it, in one way or another, relates to educational equity, so issues of, of educational equity. And actually, before I say that, I should also say thank you uh, to Bill and to Caitlin and to everyone here for having me out. Um, I've been to Las Vegas a few times for different purposes from this one, and they have all, they've all been very fun, but this, this feels like the first time I've gotten to know the city a bit, and it's been a really nice, um, enriching and rewarding experience to meet uh, some of the people of Las Vegas, understand something about the schools and the university, so, so thank you all for sort of welcoming me into your community. So I do, I do education policy research on issues related to educational equity. And whenever you start a talk on um, something related to educational equity, I think it's, it's worth pointing out that American schools are not equal and they are not equitable. And you don't have to look very far to see evidence of that. So to start, and there's no need to worry about details here, but one place we often look for evidence of educational equity is test scores to see how do different groups of students perform on standardized tests. So this is just sort of one, I grabbed math scores for grade eight, and this is gonna say something about the gaps between the average scores for white students and black students, for students who qualify for free or reduced price lunch, which is an indicator for poverty and students who do not, and then for Hispanic and Latinx students and, and white students. And these gaps, the, the takeaways here, these are big, big gaps. So, and they're not going away quickly enough. And so just to put some of the, the size here in perspective, they're in standard deviations, which is a little bit confusing. The average score for, uh, in the average eighth grade math score for a black student in the United States would place somewhere between the 10th and 25th percentile in the distribution of white student scores. Very similarly, the, the average score for a student in poverty would place between the 10th and 25th percentile of scores for students not in poverty. And the average score for a Hispanic student would place right around the 25th percentile of the white student distribution. Those are big, big gaps that are very difficult to close and again, have not been closing very quickly. That's not to say, none of this is to say that schools cause all of this. We, we kind of have a tendency to blame schools for all of the gaps that show up in schools. It may be that schools contribute though. Um, and that's, that's sort of where we're gonna dig in. So this is, this is an outcome, evidence of, 
Um, in inequality and in outcome, we see it in inputs too. So there's a, an organization, EdBuild, that recently did a study of, of how much local and state funding goes into schools, uh, depending on whether the districts are predominantly white, 75% white or more, predominantly non-white, and then whether they're low poverty or high poverty districts, and um, probably not to the surprise of many here, districts that are low poverty and that are predominantly white get more money from local and state government. So, it's not hard to find inequities. What we're gonna look at though is a different type of inequity, which is the reality that the day-to-day -day experience of being in schools is different for students of different backgrounds. And so where, where we're gonna look for that is in uh, student discipline. And this is, so I don't love the way that the, the US Department of Education presents this, I think it's a little bit confusing, but this is the most recent data we have nationwide on discipline disparities. And what they're showing here, so you have four bars. The first bar is the, um, these, these are boys, so this is male enrollment, and this is what the schools look like, the first and third bars. So what this is saying is 25% of students in US public schools are white boys. That's at bottom, 25, bottom left, 25%. 8% are black or African American boys, 3% Asian boys, 13% Hispanic or Latino uh, boys, and then you have female enrollment, kind of two bars over. The big takeaway from this graph, where we see these disparities more than anywhere else, is among um, African Americans. So, 8% of the US student population is African American boys. 8% of the US student population is African American girls. 25% of, of the suspensions in this country go to African American boys, and 14% go to, to African American girls. So while African Americans compose about 16% of the student population in the United States, they account for 39% of the suspensions. That is, again, a big, big gap. They start early, so this is from a couple of years before that, that chart, but um, I don't think there's much reason to believe this has changed. Disparities in discipline for black students and boys appeared as early as preschool, according to the Department of Education's Civil Rights Data Collection for school year 2013-14. Black students accounted for 19% of all public preschool students, represented 47% of students suspended from preschool. So those are, those are suspensions for kids who are three and four years old. Again, big, big gaps, and I don't know what three-year-olds do to warrant suspensions, but um, we see it, we see it even there. It's true in Nevada. So this, I'm borrowing some data here from uh, ProPublica. The top line is what the Nevada population of public school students looks like. It's about 10% black, 42% Hispanic, 34% white, 7% Asian and Pacific Islander, 6% two or more races, and 1% Native American. The next two bars that are sort of parallel to what we just looked at for the country are gonna look at the, the composition of students who get an out of school suspension and the composition of students who are expelled. Again, look at how different those, the blue bars look, right? So those, this is African Americans. So while African Americans are 10% of the Nevada public schools student population, 27% of the uh, suspension population and 36% of the expulsion population. Here in Clark County, not all that different. So again, where we see the big disparities is uh, with African American students, about 14% of the district is African American, 32% of suspensions go to African American students, and 38% of expulsions. So expulsion being kicked out of school, right? Sus suspensions being kicked out temporarily, expulsion being pushed out altogether. So why, why worry about this stuff? Why worry about discipline disparities? There are a few reasons. To start, we know that suspension and expulsion is at least correlated with a whole bunch of negative outcomes, of bad stuff happening to people. When I say at least correlated, I mean we don't know that it causes it. We don't know that, that kicking a kid out of school for a day or for a year actually causes uh, these bad outcomes. That's actually really difficult to measure and we don't have great measurements of that. But we know, if nothing else, that it's, that it's associated with it. And so it's associated with lower academic outcomes which makes sense intuitively, that if you're not in school, you're probably not gonna perform as well um, academically. Lower probability of on-time graduation. And a really big one, um, increased contact with the juvenile and criminal justice systems. And so have, um, have you all heard of school-to-prison pipeline as a term that, that people have talked about before? So 
This is sort of the heart of the concern about discipline disparities and the overuse of what's called exclusionary discipline. So exclusionary discipline meaning we're excluding students because we're suspending or expelling them. And the, the heart of that concern is that we're putting kids in touch with police essentially for what can be pretty minor matters that seem like they could have been handled by schools. So um, we have this sort of school to prison pipeline question uh, here. We also have this reality that, that kids and particularly students of color and students in poverty are getting these really harsh messages from public institutions in public schools that exist to teach and develop kids. That is, that this is the place where we as a society develop young people. And uh, kids are getting messages to, to sort of get out uh, because you know, their, their behaviors aren't, aren't good enough to, to sort of allow to stay in that, that school community. And that's a harsh message and it's one that comes very early in life. So, so I worry about the, the, the um, consequences of that. We also have this sort of more generally unsettling possibility that kids experience discrimination at school. Again, these are public institutions, it's children, and it just should be worrisome that, that there's possibility of discrimination. We're gonna talk a lot about what discrimination would look like and what it wouldn't, because that's a very difficult question to answer when it comes to understanding these gaps. Um, and there can be different explanations for what it is that contributes to those big, big gaps in, um, in suspension rates. So, all of this has caught the attention of a whole lot of policymakers, and that's true at the federal level, it's true at the state level, and it's true at the local level. The big moment at the federal level came in, in 2014, and the Obama administration uh, issued what's called the Dear Colleague Letter. And essentially what they did was the Department of, of Justice and the Department of Education jointly got together and they wrote a letter to, to schools and to districts that gave them some sort of guidelines for what they had to do as it relates to the, these big gaps in uh, student discipline, and particularly suspension and expulsion. And they did this in the, in the context of concern that for a long time we had these kind of zero tolerance policies that were very quick to punish students and we may not have ever sort of totally addressed those and cleaned them up. So that's, that's sort of the context in which they're operating. What this letter did is up for debate. It was an incredibly controversial letter, um, which I'll get to in a second for why that was. Uh, people read the letter differently. To my eye, what the letter does is it, first of all, it just describes the federal laws that prohibit schools from discriminating on the basis of race when it comes to student discipline. Second of all, it explains what it is that constitutes student, dis student uh, or discrimination in student discipline. So what is discrimination? And basically they talk about two types. Uh, the Obama administration talked about two types of, of discrimination. One is what they call different treatment. That can take a few different forms. It would, you would have a case of different treatment if a school put in place a policy that said we're going to suspend black or Hispanic students and we're not gonna suspend white students. That essentially never happens. It can, uh, you can have a case of different treatment if you have a school that puts in place a discipline policy that seems like it's targeting a particular group. So for example, if you ban a certain hairstyle that's worn by a particular group and not others, that can constitute uh, different treatment. And then what uh, I'm gonna dig into quite a bit is this, this third definition of um, different treatment, which is intentional discrimination. And what they mean by intentional discrimination is a facially neutral policy, which means the policy itself doesn't say we're gonna treat anyone differently. But when it comes to the way that policy is administered and how students are punished, students of different groups are punished differently. So certain groups are punished more harshly than other groups are. The second side of all of this is um, disparate impact. So that's a, a question of whether the existence of a policy sort of does harm to a particular group. And they have this test where you go through and you look, uh, did this policy adversely affect a group? Um, did it serve a legitimate educational goal? And was there another way to serve that goal that didn't involve the policy that again could sort of get a, a school or a district in trouble for discriminatory uh, discipline? This third point is important. So in this, this generated some of the controversy. They threatened investigation for evidence of discriminatory practices. So part of, in fact, um, I would argue the primary role of the federal government in education is the protection of student civil rights. We have a lot of education governance happens at the local and state level. 
The federal government funds about, I think it's 10 to 15 percent of schools, but their primary role historically has been the sort of protection of, of student civil rights. And part of the way they do that is they investigate uh, claims or suggestions of some kind of civil rights violation. And they were very clear in this letter that they were going to investigate if it looked like a school or a district was discriminating with the way that it disciplined students. At the end of the letter, they recommend some practices to schools and to districts for how you could sort of keep from getting in trouble with uh, the federal government. So they laid out some non-exclusionary, sort of less severe uh, ways of addressing student misbehavior. Uh, we'll talk a bit about this. It's, has anyone heard of restorative justice practices? So restorative justice, uh, there are different kind of positive behavioral interventions and supports in ways of, of working with students that don't involve uh, pushing them out. This, this letter, uh, as I said, was really controversial. It was really fiercely opposed by a lot of conservatives, and there are a few reasons for that. So one reason is actually just about governance process. A lot of Republicans are uncomfortable with the idea that an executive branch will kind of issue rules in this way and not go through Congress. So this is a way that the Department of Education or the Department of Justice can sort of make rules uh, without going through the full legislative process. Another part of it was disparate impact. There was sort of a lot of, a lot of question as to whether disparate impact was an appropriate standard here. There was a big question about intentional discrimination. And so what a lot of folks would say is we might have suggestions that schools discriminate in student discipline. We might have some individual cases here and there, but we don't have any studies that show plainly that yes, black students and white students, or whatever the group may be, are treated differently by educators. And um, that is sort of the hook by which the federal government got into this. That's, that's what motivated some of the letter, was a sense that that is what's happening. And the part of the critique that came from conservatives was, if in the absence of that kind of evidence, if we're threatening investigations, then when an investigation is opened, it makes a district look guilty. So it's a way of sort of implying that a district has racist practices without us actually knowing, and just the existence of the investigation does that. And then uh, a sort of um, a last reason for some of the controversy was there was a claim that schools as as schools had kind of moved away from some of these harsher discipline practices, that they had become more violent, less safe places. And uh, conveniently enough, yesterday, the Department of Education released a bunch of data on uh, student behaviors and safety. There is not a lot of evidence for that. So the, there is a, a bit of a narrative that schools have kind of descended into chaos lately. Um, that is not true, and schools K-12 schools in the US are very safe places for the most part. That's not true everywhere, but for the most part, they're very safe places. And they're much safer than they were 20 years ago and even maybe safer than they were uh, three or four years ago. So here, this is the rate per 100 students of any kind of victimization on the top left, theft on the top right, uh, all violent victimization on the bottom left and serious violent victimization. I think the difference between the two on the bottom is they have a, a category that's called simple assault that um, shows up in the left group but not the, the right group. But these lines are going down, right? And they, um, the green lines, by the way, are what happened at school, the, or the dark green, the light green lines are what happened to students away from school. But schools are generally safe places. And if you look at where these dots are in 2017, it's not as if they're sort of spiking back up. So, I have questions about the claim that, that schools have become sort of much more chaotic over the last couple of years. Having said that, um, uh, the Trump administration in 2018 uh, scrapped the letter. So they threw away the letter that the Obama administration put in place in 2014. The start, the moment that, that spawned that was the Parkland shooting in last February, the school shooting in Florida. And uh, what the, so in the aftermath of that shooting, there was sort of pressure on the federal government to do something about student safety. What they did is they created a federal commission on school safety, and that commission started digging into how can we make schools safer, how can we prevent gun violence in schools and other kinds of violence in schools. As they were deliberating, people were sort of noticing that it was, they, the administration had been oddly quiet on this uh, dear colleague letter from the Obama administration. For as controversial as it was, it seemed strange to people that they didn't just uh, tear it up because they could just as easily as the Obama administration put the letter out, they could have gotten rid of it. Um, it became clear that they were going to wrap 
uh, discipline into student safety. So they sort of drew a line between what happened in Parkland and this, this kind of more lenient, restorative, uh, gentler type of discipline that the Obama administration had advocated. They put that in that report on the right um, in, December, in last December, and then a few days later, the Departments of Justice and Education jointly issued another one of these letters, and it said that that, the, that letter from the Obama administration is no longer relevant. We're, we're scrapping it, we're throwing it away. So now, so now where, the federal, where federal policy stands is the guidance that was in place and the sort of threat of investigation that districts felt a year ago and, and sort of back to 2014 is no longer in place, right? So um, uh, that's gone. At the same time, though, we've had uh, quite a bit of action at the state and local policy levels on this. So there's a group, the Education Commission on the States, that just did a kind of inventory of where state laws are on student discipline. And a lot of the changes have happened very recently. And so they, they say that uh, about 16 states in D.C. limit the use of suspension and, and expulsion in certain grades. That's usually early grades. So what we looked at with uh, little guys, with preschoolers, that's, it's targeting those kinds of, of um, suspensions and expulsions and, and not allowing them. A bunch of states limit the use of suspension and expulsion for certain minor offenses, and that includes about 17 in, in Washington, D.C., banning it for attendance and truancy violations. So uh, it sort of makes sense you wouldn't punish students for not being in school by kicking them more out of school. Uh, both of those, by the way, include Nevada. So Nevada is in both of those camps uh, in some form. It, um, 27 states explicitly prohibit corporal punishment, so like physically punishing kids, uh, which means that a lot of states don't explicitly prohibit that. Um, in fact, a number of them, all but four of the remaining, explicitly allow it, and they just kick it down to the district to decide what districts want to do. And there actually are a fair number of districts in the country that still use corporal punishment. About 30 states and the District of Columbia encourage the use of some of these non-punitive, more supportive discipline practices, like restorative justice. That, for now, does not include Nevada. Um, However, there is, my understanding is there's an assembly bill now that is uh, up for discussion that would require a restorative justice plan uh, before suspending certain students, like kids in certain grades, for certain types of offenses. So I'm not sure where, that, where that's going, but it's possible that that would sort of change that last bullet point. And then Clark County School District has gotten um, interested and concerned about this. They are very aware of the gaps that I showed you before for Clark County and have been particularly aiming to reduce referrals to police, so getting kids, again, in that sort of uh, school-to-prison pipeline, um, by using, for one, some of these in-school interventions for what seem like minor criminal acts, like trespassing and petty larceny. And then they're also sort of using, their, it sounds like they're partnering with some nonprofits and trying to, to bring in mentors and other supports to figure out what is at the root of misbehavior and can they do something more productive to, to address it. All right, so where this is going and where I, what I'm going to talk to you a bit about is a look at some data um, from, I'm going to show you some data from the state of Louisiana. And what motivates that is we know that racial discipline disparities are very large. So all that controversy I mentioned about the letters and about whether it's discrimination that causes these disparities, there isn't any controversy about the fact that those, those disparities exist, right? Like those, that is, those data are not particularly contested. We don't know much about where and how they arise, and that has implications. Um, so the question that's sort of motivating this work is whether it's possible to find what seems like pretty clear evidence of intentional discrimination, so that is kids of different backgrounds being treated differently for similar behaviors, system-wide in um, education data. So not a single case that looks like an isolated case of discrimination, but can we see it when we look at what's happening across the state? That I, in my view, it is, it is probably impossible to come up with a measure of how much discrimination there is as a whole. If you sort of think about the, the process of, uh, think about what students experience in schools, I mean, imagine, uh, I like to imagine, imagine a white student sort of speaking out in class and talking back to a teacher and that teacher decides, you know, I'm gonna let that slide, or maybe subconsciously just doesn't think of it and never sends that student to the principal's office. A week later, a black student speaks out, gets sent to the principal's office. 
no one ever observes outside of that classroom what happened with that white student in the first place. So we can never see that. And it becomes very difficult to measure that kind of thing. So in my view, um, a lot of that sort of stays behind the closed doors of classrooms. And it's too hard for us to observe to say, of those gaps, this is how much of it is caused by some form of discrimination. There are other reasons I think that's true too, but um, I think that's essentially impossible. It might be possible to show with a sort of really cautious and careful analysis that discrimination happens in certain places in certain times. So uh, what, what this study is going to do is it's going to look in the most sort of careful, cautious, transparent way it can at a place where it seems like there shouldn't be any disparities unless they are the product of schools treating kids differently, um, uh, kids of different races differently. To do that, you need what's called, uh, so again, in my view, you really need what's called student level education data. So uh, the, the charts that I showed you a, a few minutes ago that showed the kind of overall gaps, you can't see it. You can't assess evidence of discrimination when you're looking at those kinds of charts. You need to be able to go in and dig in and really understand what was happening in schools. So given that, I would love to be able to show you uh, data from, from Nevada. I don't have data from Nevada. I have data, student level data from Louisiana. So I'm going to show you what, what happened in Louisiana. I do a lot of work on the schools in New Orleans and on the Louisiana education system. And um, uh, there's, so I, I just sort of finished this, this study with some colleagues where we look at, we use student level data from Louisiana to study the origins of uh, discipline disparities in the state of Louisiana. We have records from 2000, 2001 through 2013, 14. When you tally it up, it's about 10 million student observations because we'll see the same kid for a bunch of years. And so it's a big data set, right? So it's a lot of data we're working with. In our, in our data set, we, we can see the student's race. And Louisiana is a very black and white state. It's about half black and about half white. Uh, we see their free and reduced price lunch status, and about half of the students in Louisiana are always eligible for free lunch. We're going to call those students poor for some of the comparisons I'm going to show you in a second. About a quarter never are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. We're going to call those students non-poor for these comparisons. And then we get some other demographic and academic information. And in addition to that, we get to see some information about infractions that led to suspensions and expulsions. And so when something happens that, that triggers a kid getting a suspension or expulsion, the school is recording what was it? What was the infraction type? And we have 49 different types. Was it an assault? Was it a fight? Was it what they call willful disobedience, which is this sort of vague catch-all term that is the most common uh, cause of suspension and is generally thought to be a pretty mild misbehavior. So we see what, what was the infraction type? What was the date of the infraction? How severe was it? So if, if it was a suspension, for how many days were you suspended? Um, and where did the suspension happen? Was it an in-school or an out-of-school suspension? We, we see in Louisiana, too, these big sort of raw gaps in suspension rates. About 25% of black students, about 12% of white students are suspended in any given year in Louisiana. It's about 21% of poor students and 9% of, of uh, non-poor, and again, that's always poor and never poor. There's a sometimes poor group that we're going to omit just because it's sort of easier when it comes to presenting. Um, and now, so this is, now I'm going to kind of like mark you through the way we're thinking about this as, as researchers who are trying to understand what's going on. And we're going we're to walk through three steps. The first step is going to be to try to figure out where these gaps come up. And uh, question number one is, do they arise within schools or do they arise across schools? You could imagine if you looked within every school, and in every school you had a black suspension rate that was higher than a white suspension rate in school one. In school two, you have a black suspension rate that's higher than a white suspension rate. And you keep going, and then you aggregate that all up, you're going to see, overall, you're going to see discipline disparities, right? You're going to see that the suspension rate for black students is higher than the suspension rate for white students across the state. You could also imagine that in any given school, you have the same suspension rate for black students and for white students. But in schools that have mostly white students, the suspension rates are low. In schools that have mostly black students, the suspension rates are high. When you aggregate all of that up, you're going to find that black students are suspended at higher rates than white students. That distinction matters because the way to address those disparities is different. If it's, a, if it's coming up within schools, it starts to sort of point you in the direction of do we need uh, to worry about by, do we need implicit bias trainings? And do we need to worry about what's going on within schools that's causing these within school gaps? If it's arising across schools, it points more in the direction of, do we have to worry that schools that disproportionately serve students of color and students in poverty are 
um, like overly punitive in how they're handling discipline, right? Those are two different causes. The conventional wisdom and the sort of early research on this has pointed toward across schools being the source of discipline disparities. That, that um, the sort of looks at some of the data I showed you early on, uh, people were thinking or suggesting uh, this is coming across schools, okay? So it's coming from schools behaving differently depending on the types of kids they have. After we look at that, we're gonna look for evidence of students being punished differently for the same types of infractions. So here, when we have records of black students and white students using profanity, our, our black students suspended longer than white students, and our poor students suspended longer than non-poor students for use of profanity. And then from there, we're gonna go to what we think is sort of the contribution, what's, what's novel about the work, which is we're gonna go in this weird corner of our data for where we think we can kind of credibly rule out any explanation other than something that looks like intentional discrimination. That is, kids being treated differently, um, kids of different races being treated differently. And what we do is we're gonna look at a fight between a white student and a black student, and a fight between a poor student and a non-poor student, where they have a really similar uh, background when it comes to discipline history in where the incident itself is coded as each student fighting. It's not an assault, it's not one student beating the other student up, it's not anything else. It's coded as a sort of equal terms fight between a white student and a black student or a poor student and a non-poor student. And um, to us, those should yield the same suspensions, right? So. Um, in the absence of any indication why one student would be suspended longer than the other, and in most cases they do, you'll see this in a second, they do yield equal suspensions. We're gonna look to see at the margins are black students or white students suspended more harshly for those, for those fights. All right, so to that, that first question, are gaps arising within schools or across schools? Um, this is a little tricky to, to follow too, but so down here on the bottom on the x-axis, that's grade, so grade level, so we have kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but there's a kind of shaded blue part behind the, the lines. Um, that is showing the overall suspension gap, so the gap in suspension rates between, in this case, black and white students. And so you'll see it's highest um, in about sixth and seventh grade. It's about a 20 percentage point difference, where black students are suspended about, um, at a rate that's about 20 percentage points higher than, than white students. And what these lines are doing is they're showing how, when you break that apart, when you break it into how much of it was coming uh, within schools versus how much, how much is coming across schools, the green line is showing the part that's coming within schools. The red line is showing the part that's coming across schools that are in the same school district. And the blue line is showing the part that's coming across districts. And the, take, the, the takeaway here is that a lot of this is coming within schools, right? It's about half, and in some grades it's quite a bit more than half, is accounted for by that green line. So a lot of this is a story of black students in the same schools as white students being suspended more often and longer, right? So that, that it's hard to know what to make of that in and of itself. It again may point in the direction of we need to be thinking about bias in schools. It's not smoking gun evidence of that yet, so, but it's reason to look more closely at, what, at what's going on. Uh, this is the same chart for poor and non-poor students, and the pa pattern, again, is very similar. You see the within school part is substantial. All right, so number two of that, that, those three steps that I laid out, we're gonna look now to see if when we have the same infraction type, so we have uh, willful disobedience or we have profanity, are students of different backgrounds punished differently? Do they get longer or shorter suspensions in a way that's associated with uh, race or with their um, family uh, financial status? So uh, black bars for black students, white bars for white students, in this, this sort of top set where it's overall, you'll see that um, across the state, when we sort of control for the type of infraction, black students are suspended significantly longer than white students are. Um, when you slip down to the bottom here, the within schools, when we look at that same kind of analysis just within the same schools, again, you see black students are suspended longer than white students. It's not as, the gap isn't as wide. It's again, statistically significant, and it's, um, it's a little hard to tell here, but uh, because this is a sort of regression adjusted stuff, um, but uh, the gaps are, are decently sized too. Um, again, parallel poor and non-poor with poor students represented in blue and non-poor students represented in gray. And again, you see uh, a big gap overall, a gap that's smaller but still significant, statistically significant too, when you go within schools. And 
this, this to me is suggestive of some kind of discrimination, but uh, we are again going to be super cautious with this and we're going to look only when we feel like we're really comfortable saying, I don't know what else could be causing these gaps. There's still enough we don't observe here that maybe if you were really cautious, you would worry about it. So maybe, for example, um, when, maybe when black students use profanity, they say worse words than white students do. I don't know. Um, there's n I have no reason to believe that's the case, but we don't observe that in our data. So uh, it would be terrific, actually, to have a data set that had the word that every kid used when he was suspended for profanity. They don't show that to us, so, so we don't know. So maybe, maybe there's something we can't see that makes these, these differences reflect like some actual difference in the way that, that students were acting out in class. So, Again, I think there's a lot here to suggest possible discrimination, but we're going to be super conservative. We're just going to say we're going to look where we're really con confident that, that there's not, nothing else that we could attribute these gaps to. And so uh, to do that, we're going to go to these fights. Um, and let me show you what, you're, what this table is showing. So what this table is showing is a fight between a student from group one and a student from group two. So the, the first row in this table is a, student, is a fight between a black student and a white student. In our data over that 14 years, we have about 20,000 of those fights. Most of the time, the kids get the same suspension length, okay? So the, as you would expect, you have a white student and a black student. They're going probably to a principal's or an assistant principal's office. Uh, and most of the time, people are getting the same punishment, which seems sort of obviously true. What we are interested in is when those things split apart and there's nothing indicated anywhere in our data that kids should be getting different punishments, does it tip in one direction or the other? And um, in this case, about 11% of the time, it's the black student who gets suspended longer. About 9% of the time, it's the white student who's suspended longer. Those p-values on the right, those are indicators of, of um, statistical significance, so how sure are we that we have a real difference, that we're looking at a real difference and not just kind of statistical noise. Where I've, I've colored in red, that's where we have a significant difference, and the group that's in red is the group that is punished more harshly. So in these black-white fights, it's black students who are more often than not the recipients of the longer suspensions. When poor students fight non-poor students, it's poor students who, who most often get the longer suspension. And then we start sort of crossing um, race, uh, economic status, and gender. I'll tell you that the, um, the row that shocked me the most in this table is the bottom one. So when you look at what, so actually before I get to that, let me say the, the third row here, male, female, we thought for sure we will see that males get punished longer than females when you have a boy and a girl get into a fight. There's no difference. Um, so student one, 15.5% of the time, that's boys. Girls suspended longer, 15.4% of the time. That's not, a, that's not a statistically significant difference. That's not a meaningful difference. There's nothing there. There are a couple of others here that are not in red. If you look at the total number of fights, it's a small number of fights. So some of that is just that we, we don't actually have enough data to really identify much going on there. And then, the row that jumps off the page to me is the bottom one in this, uh, in this table, which is when a black girl and a white boy get into a fight, the black girl is, is significantly more likely to get the longer suspension. And my, I'm not sure that my prior would have said that. I would have thought for sure that boys get punished more harshly. But even in that case, we see 18%, 18.2% 18 of the time, it's the black girl who gets the longer suspension. 15.6% of the time, it's, it's the white boy. Um, so, as I said, uh, we would argue that that is, that is evidence of that type of intentional discrimination that was used to justify the Obama administration sort of moving into this space and issuing that to your colleague letter. I'll say there's still an assumption, so when you try to do these kinds of data analyses and you're trying to be as careful as you can, you always are making assumptions somewhere or the other. The assumption here that, that we sort of need to believe, to believe that this is a real, this is sort of clear evidence across a state of discrimination and how kids are, are disciplined, is that we have to assume that when you have these fights, it's not the case that one group is more responsible for some reason than the other group. So it's not that they initiate more in some way that we can't observe. We observe a lot in our data, we don't observe everything. So there's a, there is that sort of operating in the background. I feel very comfortable with what we observe and sort of given how, how much we've, we've like zeroed this in, but there still is an assumption operating in the background there. Um, we, so we put, we put out a draft of this paper and we started hearing from people who are skeptical of the existence of discrimination in student discipline at all. And they told us, you know, you, you haven't, 
controlled for this or that, and you didn't look at, at this group of students or that group of students. So we did everything that every one of them told us that we hadn't done and we should have done. And in every single one of those analyses, the gap still shows up, it's still significant, and it's, it's there, right? So we did all of that stuff. We did our, a bunch of our own checks where we define things in all kinds of different ways, and every time we did it, we were seeing racial gaps in these fights. Now, stepping back and putting them in context, on one hand, the size of those gaps is kind of modest, right? It's a few percentage points here and there in, in which students are being suspended more often than others. On the other hand, so first of all, these are the easiest types of gaps to avoid. This is uh, two students coming to, because these fights are just two students, it's two students coming before a principal or an assistant principal who is making a determination right there for each of the students uh, punishment lengths, and you would think that if there, if there were ever a sort of softball for a principal to, to punish fairly, it would be in that moment, and still in that moment we see, we see disparities. And the second part of this, in, in related, is that given that, and the given that all we're trying to do is, is find this part of our data where we can sort of most confidently say we think something is going on here, there's good reason to believe that this is just the tip of a much larger iceberg. So for example, it would be very interesting to see what would happen if two black students got into a fight uh, one day and then in the same school, uh, two white students got into a fight a month later and see how those, those punishments look. We did, black students get longer suspensions. There, there's less that we're observing because we don't know that it's a fight that was coded as the two kids acting in the same way. So again, we're being like super cautious and just trying to, to figure out can we establish that, that discrimination exists. But there's lots of reason to believe that this is, that what we're seeing is just the sort of tip that's, that's poking its head above the, the surface of the water. All right, so wrapping up, I have a, a couple slides and I'd love to get um, questions and thoughts and experiences and comments and whatever, whatever else uh, might be on your mind. Uh, so, okay, so um, what do we do about this? So, one, as I said, my view of the federal government's role in education is that its primary function is to protect the civil rights of students, and a big part of that function is addressing discrimination in the way that different kids are treated. I think there's a real role here for the Office of Civil Rights within the Department of Education. I, my view is that the current Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education is not fulfilling that role. So, so the, there has been a sort of shift in the way that that office operates, where now it is much more, it's so it will look into a case of reported discrimination in a sort of very particular case affecting a very particular student. It's very difficult to show with a single student proof of discrimination. The department has been much less interested in looking into these sort of more systemic, bigger problems that may be in districts and schools. Um, I think there's a role for the federal government there. Local and state governments have roles to play too. Some of that may relate to the policies we talked about kind of early on at the beginning. Some of it too is making data available for this kind of research. So in states like Louisiana where you can do this, you can learn a lot more and you can start to sort of figure out what works for solving these kinds of problems. In states where you don't have that kind of data availability, it's much harder and so that's a, there are policies around data sharing. Um, schools more and more are turning to these less punitive um, approaches to discipline. So some of them are targeted at the students who had the, the incident occur. So restorative justice practices are one. And uh, it's worth, if you're interested in this, it's worth taking a look on YouTube and looking up some uh, videos of restorative justice circles. They're interesting. Essentially what, it, they vary from school to school, but what they often do is they'll bring together, after an incident, they'll bring together the student who uh, was sort of the instigator, or it could be that it was a sort of equal parts kind of deal. They'll often bring together the victim and others who are sort of involved, and they'll sit them around, and the purpose of this circle, this restorative justice circle, is to try to get at sort of the root of what it was that caused the incident and uh, do something about it. So not just kind of push a kid out with the thought being that if you just push a kid out, you're, at the end of the day, you're not actually addressing the issue, but bring them together and see if you can do something to address the, the cause of the, the incident. There are also some school-wide interventions like these uh, positive behavioral interventions and supports that try to, to essentially turn kids, to give kids uh, toolkits to problem solve themselves and uh, to handle kind of conflict resolution on their own that don't just target kids after incidents but are just meant to sort of fulfill school's obligation to, to um, develop students as people. <laughs> 
and I should say, I should say though, that with, with all of this, the research on the effects of these non-exclusionary approaches, so approaches like restorative justice, it's really limited. And we really honestly don't know very much yet about whether they work and what ways they work or don't. There's been a fair amount of research. Not much of the research has gone and tried to kind of carefully figure out what are the effects of these things. Rand just did a study that was a kind of random assignment experimental study in Pittsburgh at, of a restorative justice program, and it had some positive effects. Teachers reported a sort of better, safer school climate, and they had a reduction in suspensions. It had some negative effects. Uh, middle school's test scores dropped, which they, they attributed to this sort of taking a lot of time. And then it had some kind of null effects where it didn't seem to do anything. Like there was no real drop in the kind of more serious violent incidents in the schools. And then there, so Philadelphia made a move toward banning uh, suspensions for kind of minor offenses in younger kids. And there have been a couple of studies of what happened in Philadelphia. And um, the sort of primary takeaway is that it seems like a lot of schools just didn't pay attention to the ban. They kept doing it anyway. So there's a, like a compliance question about how you do it. And then among the schools that did, it seemed like some did it well and some did not do it well. And that is very likely because these types of interventions need to be done with care, with people who sort of understand why they're doing it and how to do it and who have been trained properly. And so there is, uh, there is still a lot for us to learn and to make sure that schools kind of are on top of what they have to be doing with this. And then my last slide here. So just to, to review for a bit, so those gaps are coming up both within schools and across schools, which to me suggests that you probably need both within school remedies and across school remedies. And we have a habit in my world, which is kind of education policy, of thinking that schools do everything and solve everything. Uh, I don't believe that. I think chances are that there are a whole lot of problems that if they were solved outside of schools would help with this kind of thing too. To us, these interracial fight disparities suggest intentional discrimination, which suggests a role for um, the federal government in addressing disparities. They have implications for schools and for students in those schools. Part of what this means, and this is true of the first bullet point too, is that when, when gaps are coming up within schools, they're visible to students. If they were coming up across schools, Students might not actually see them because it might sort of come as you aggregate across a bunch of schools but not be visible to individual students. But students see the stuff and they feel it. And there are kids who are walking out of principal offices wondering why they got the longer suspension. Um, a caveat here, so this is Louisiana, a question that, I, that I've gotten before is like, hey, isn't Louisiana particularly racist? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, this is, there certainly are other studies from other states around the country that have shown a lot of evidence of different types of discrimination in different areas. Uh, I would love, again, to do this kind of thing in Nevada, in, in a bunch of other states. The primary limitation there is data availability. Uh, but um, I'll sort of leave that out there as a caveat. And then I'll, I'll close with the thought that I think we need to think hard about the types of messages that kids get from schools. Um, related to, to the school to prison pipeline thing, but really when we think about the purposes of schools and why we have public education systems and why, what, why that we do that whole thing, we lately have sort of taken this approach that the whole purpose of schooling is to get kids um, proficient in core academic subjects in math and English and get them into college and get them jobs they want. That is That view, which I think is the dominant view right now, is historically and anomalous. That is not the way we have always looked at schools and what, what they're supposed to do. The purpose of schools is much broader in my view. It's to teach and to nurture and to develop. And if kids misbehaving in schools, especially for more minor misbehaviors, is something that turns you over to police, I think we have hard questions to ask about whether we're delivering on what our schools were designed and are designed to do. Um, and then just kind of on this particular point, I think there's lots of reason to, to keep considering and working on these, these less punitive discipline approaches with the caveat that it does seem like making sure everyone is prepared and buys in um, and has been trained and that it's implemented well could be really important to the kind of long-term success of these programs. And so I will stop there and be happy to take comments and questions. Tell me I'm wrong on stuff and why you don't believe me. Have a qualitative study 
on student experience with that type with those type of situations, especially in that gap between like fifth and eighth grade where it seems the most uh, uh, discrepancy, the biggest discrepancies are in suspensions and expulsions. Same, do you have an idea? I'd love to do it. <laughs> um, so maybe, it is, so for one, it's possible to survey students. And there are surveys of students. And there's a lot of indication that, that students don't feel, uh, a lot of students have a sense that their space has been criminalized. And that they're, they are sort of always walking on eggshells and worried about what's, uh, what they will be punished for. There may be other ways of getting at some of this. So. Uh, I've been talking with, with folks about whether we might be able to sort of simulate. Um, so I didn't mention a study that I think is a, did I mention the Yale study where they followed the eyes? I don't think I did. So one, one study on this that doesn't actually get it at true behaviors in schools, but is interesting at sort of giving us a glimpse of why there might be um, uh, discrimination that happens is there's a group of Yale researchers, I think they're psychologists, and they took a bunch of, I think it was 130 or 140 um, early childhood teachers, and they got them at this conference and sat them down and they asked them to watch videos of four uh, young kids, so uh, little ones, uh, and monitor them for signs of troubling behaviors. And so they sit them down and there are four kids in these videos. It's a, a white boy, a white girl, a black boy, and a black girl. And they used some fancy technology stuff, and they wired them, and they watched what they, they uh, the researchers monitored what the teachers looked at while they were watching this video. The video had no signs of any troubling behaviors. It was just kids hanging out, being doing kid things. And they found that the eye movements were following the black students, and particularly the black boy, more than they were following any of the other kids um, in that setting. So there are creative ways to do some of this, even where you can't kind of conventionally collect data. We've been talking about whether it might be possible to do some of that kind of eye movement stuff and work with kids, uh, with older kids who are in middle school and high school and start to get a feel. Um, and you can like monitor for heart rate and see when, when students start to get stressed out and what worries them. And, and we're trying to think about ways of, of looking at that and sort of peeking behind uh, some of these curtains that are hard for quantitative researchers to peek behind. But um, uh, I would love to hear more ideas. It's, a, it's not an area that I think is, is uh, too well developed yet. I want to know, do you guys collect any data on the demographics of the, uh, you mentioned like, uh, principals and assistant principals, um, and if you do or if you don't, how do you think that would affect the overall situation? That, so that is, a, that is a great question. And that is, we, um, we actually were, were about to write a paper on this, this exact topic. So if you, look at, if you look at our data for something like this, we, we know who the principals and who the assistant principals are. We don't know who it was who actually decided the punishment. So nowhere in our data does it say that, um, I'll, Sebastian, I'll pick on Sebastian because I know him, um, that Sebastian was suspended for three days by assistant principal Jones. It does not say that. But we know that there's an assistant principal Jones and assistant principal Daniels and principal whatever. We know the background of the principals. We know their races. Um, when we looked at the back, when we tried to figure out, okay, what is it about schools where we see bigger gaps and smaller gaps? We saw the, some of the smallest gaps when you have a diverse team of administrators. So when you have both white and black principals and assistant principals, a white and black team, you tend to get smaller gaps. When you have either an all black or an all white administrative staff, you tend to get larger gaps in both cases with black students getting longer suspensions than white students. So um, it's a great question. It's something we're gonna dig into, uh, I think, further going forward. There's this like super cool study of bias in NBA officiating that, that sort of uses the same kind of approach where they don't know who's calling which ref is calling fouls on which player, but they know what the, the sort of makeup of all of the refs was racially. And they too find bias where when you have a more, uh, when you have a more white uh, officiating crew, you get more fouls called on black, like a disproportionate number of fouls called on black players. So this is, all of this exists in like a much larger sea of literature on uh, discrimination in kind of all parts of American life, but um, it's a really good question. Yeah? Um, given the research you have done already in the different states you have been in, um, what do you think the Clark County School District could do to reduce these gaps? It's a good question, and I, so I'm very much in learning mode when it comes to Clark County. I, I am certainly not an expert on Clark County. Um, 
and so I, I uh, am reluctant to say what I think they should do until I really feel like I understand what they, what they are doing. I think it's, it is healthy. I've been sort of trying to, to learn up on what's going on. I have seen a lot of what feels like very healthy comments from people who are in Clark County who do seem like they're very aware of this and they care about it and they're exploring different types of ideas. I think it is a particularly good idea to try to find ways of not turning over um, issues to police unless they absolutely have to be turned over to police. So that has been kind of on the list, I think, of, of um, issues that Clark County is looking at. And if you have um, sort of the second that you hand a problem involving a student over to police, you so that student has a record at that point. That student is also getting a message and is sort of is beginning to think of himself as a criminal in a way that in, may, in a lot of cases, may not be necessary at all. And there might be, you know, I'm sure there are some cases that are extreme enough that it, they, they just genuinely need to go to police. But uh, spending time thinking about what has to go to police and what can we solve here and how do we get at actually addressing the, the misbehavior or is there, is there a way that we can sort of support and develop this student? I think the mentality is very good and I think the sort of push away from uh, turning over more minor matters to police is a very healthy thing. Yeah. I'm sort of going off on that with the idea of um, the school to prison pipeline idea. Is there sort of any data that sort of gives an indicator as to say what kinds of crimes say students in that situation might commit that would land them in prison? Does that sort of have any correlation to this whole system essentially that goes to the disparity gap? Yeah, so uh, correlational. There's a lot of correlational evidence that when, when kids uh, get in trouble at school. The kids who get in trouble in school are much more likely to get in trouble with the law later on in life. That is that is very, very clear. What is much harder about that is trying to figure out whether it was the way that the school reacted to the misbehavior that caused that. And I don't think we have clear evidence on that one way or another. It's a very hard thing to, to sort of uh, figure out empirically. Uh, but it is it is certainly the case that that kids who start to accrue records in in school show up more often and with more uh, severe issues in juvenile and then criminal justice systems later on. Yep. What were the, or what are the major roadblocks keeping us from getting the same metadata you got from Louisiana in other states? Is it more of this uh, legal thing, or is it just maybe there isn't the system in place yet? Yeah, so that's another, that's another really good question. And states vary on this. So we've been talking lately about how data sharing is a policy, right? So. Uh, States and districts make decisions about how open they're willing to be with the public about what is happening in schools. And they, you know, there's, there's going to be some tendency to try to be sort of cautious and not give up too much information or not sink too much time into sharing data. We have really terrific partners in Louisiana and um, it has meant that they, they to me feel very, they want to improve schools. They want to understand their, their school system better. They want to understand their students better. And there are lots of opportunities to learn things when you do have those kinds of relationships with, with researchers. But it takes legislation often to, to like figure out what are the parameters for sharing data because it's sensitive data. You know, we can't see kids' names. We don't see their social security numbers or their addresses or any of those kinds of things. But we do see their test scores and their demographic information and some of those kinds of things. So there's a state law question, and then there's a kind of relationships and trust question. And uh, some st states are in different places with this. And uh, Louisiana, so I, I did work in Louisiana for other reasons beyond data, but that was a big part of it. And the states that we know the most about the school systems and where I think we're providing the kind of most uh, real time and accurate information are the states that have been more willing to partner with researchers. I would say in Nevada in particular, Nevada has a student population that looks different from the student population in almost every other state. So I think it would be particularly valuable if Nevada started to open up a bit more when it comes to sharing data. And we would learn a lot about what's happening here so that you know, I don't have to have that caveat that says, eh, this is Louisiana, I don't know about, I don't know about Louisiana. So uh, more of that I think is a, is a healthy thing, but there are legislative hurdles and then there are relationships that have to, to work well for that to happen. And how long does that uh, like forever. <laughs> um, uh, it took, in, in Louisiana, I think it took, it started before I got there, but it took a couple of years to sort of build the foundation. And then now the data comes in uh, never as quickly as I would like or anyone would like, but steadily. You know, there's a sort of a flow of, of data. 
Can I, I'm sorry, one last, one last thing on this. If, you, if you're interested in this kind of thing and doing research with education data, whether it's, it's this kind of student level data or if, or if it's just you know, bigger picture what's going on in schools, uh, reach out to me and I, I would love, or, or um, come say hi to me afterward. I'd love to talk more about ways of doing that. I, it's, it's, I think there's a lot of good work to be done and uh, a lot of questions that we either aren't answering or aren't answering well yet. Yeah. So my question is in regards to charter schools. Are you guys thinking of doing any research into them? I know they're private, but I'm just curious, like how did they handle the discipline? Yeah, another great question. And actually, most of the research I do is on charter schools. There's, a, there's a, like a special uh, concern for charter schools when it comes to discipline, which is that charter schools, so charter schools are publicly funded but kind of privately run schools. And so uh, schools have a lot of control over what happens in, in, in those schools. And families choose to send their kids to those schools. So it's different from schools where the kids are assigned based on where they live. And what that can do is it can create incentives and opportunities for charter schools to use suspension and expulsion to push out certain kids. And there, um, so I do most, most of my work in New Orleans. New Orleans has this like totally nutty school system that's essentially all charter schools. And they were having, that was happening a lot. So they were having a lot of kids getting expelled for what seemed like really trivial, non-expulsion worthy, worthy offenses. And it prompted the schools getting together and eventually they came up with a centralized expulsion policy that said, okay, this is an okay reason to, to expel and this is not. That in the setting of, of kind of charter schools that really care about their autonomy and not being told what to do uh, was like a major feat in a sort of surprising move because this, this stuff is particularly worrisome when you, when you do get in that kind of setting. Uh, a great, uh, another great question. Um, let's talk. I do, I do not know that world very well, so I can I can maybe suggest some places to look, but I um, I don't want to point you in the wrong direction. We're coming upon the hour, so I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you, John, for walking us through a very <laughs> important topic. Thank you all for your time and your great questions. We'll be here for a few minutes if you have a, an unasked question. I don't have a next lecture to plug because we don't have another one the rest of the semester. But check us out, follow us on social media, and you'll hear about our upcoming events. Thank you.